My name is Tom Clendon and I am an ACCA SBR subject expert. And the video you are about to watch is on the tricky topic area of deferred taxation. Now, I'm going to introduce the principles. I'm going to show you some worked examples. But what I'm not doing is teaching this topic from scratch. And what I'm not doing is debriefing past examination questions. This video is aimed at building your confidence. This video is aimed at bridging the tuition phase to the revision phase of your studies. During the video, I will, from time to time, ask you to pause, ask you to stop the video. Now, the purpose for doing this is to give you space to read and more importantly, to think. Because really what I would like you to be able to do is to fully engage with the video and beat me to the punchline. I've really enjoyed putting this video together for you and I hope you engage and enjoy and learn something from this video as well. So deferred tax. Let's have a look at the why we account for deferred tax and how we account for deferred tax. But perhaps most importantly, I want to take you through three separate examples. Now, as you'll see, accounting for deferred tax is an accounting issue. It doesn't require you to have studied your national taxation system in any depth whatsoever. And as we shall see, deferred tax is normally examined alongside other accounting standards. So first of all, let's consider why we account for deferred tax. Let's just pull back and think of the reasons why we account for deferred tax. Can you think of them? Can you explain and justify the accounting for deferred tax in terms of fundamental principles, in terms of the conceptual framework. Maybe you want to pause the video and think about it. But I'm pushing on. And for me, the reason why we account for deferred tax is the accruals concept, is the matching concept. Because I believe that when we are recognising a gain, in the accounts, we should also simultaneously be recognising the tax on that gain in the same accounting period, even if we haven't been currently assessed to pay that tax. I believe in the matching concept. I believe that basically investors want to know profits in a post-tax scenario. So why we account for deferred tax fundamentally is the matching concept. And I'd like to show you a small example, an application of this principle. So we've got a revaluation gain of 10 million on the PPE and we've got no current tax assessed because the tax man will not give us a bill to pay when we've got a paper gain. Now, Tax rates are 20%. You do not need a calculator. You are, I hope, already ahead of me in realising that if we're going to match the gain with its tax implications, we're going to have to recognise an additional taxation expense of 2 million. And that taxation expense will be recognised wherever the gain is recognised, probably in equity probably in other comprehensive income, that's where the majority of gains on PPE are recognised. Having thought about the debit, having thought about the expense, you then, of course, have got the corresponding deferred taxation liability. That payment of tax will occur in the future. We haven't even been assessed with it yet. So we're recognising an additional deferred taxation liability. If you like, we're debiting the tax expense and we're crediting the deferred taxation liability. 
but there's a big part of me which doesn't really want to think in terms of debits and credits as we move into the pre-populated spreadsheet uh, at question number one it's often useful to think about how it's affecting the overall financial statements so in your other comprehensive income you'll have a revaluation gain of a net figure of eight and in your statement of financial position because of the revaluation PPE has gone up by 10. Anything that's gone through equity, other comprehensive income, will go through your other components of equity. So the net figure there is eight and you're increasing your deferred tax liability, your non-current liability by two. So that's the, that's the story on that very first little application. You understand the reason why we account for deferred tax is matching. And notice that so far, I haven't used the words temporary differences or anything like that. I'm concentrating on you understanding the why. But I would like also to link the reason why we account for deferred tax to the framework, to useful information. Now, if information is going to be useful, it has to be a faithful representation, which means that we have to give a complete picture. And including the deferred taxation liability means we are including an obligation, arguably, that we have, or arguably not, but let's not get into that at this stage. We are being more complete. We're also being relevant, being predictive, because we are telling the users that at some stage in the future, tax is going to have to be paid off two million. So there are plenty of conceptual justifications as to why we account for deferred tax. Let's move on and talk about how we account for deferred tax. And yes, I will now be talking about temporary differences. So back to basics, back to the beginning. You should know this. The deferred tax is accounted for on all of your year end temporary differences between the carrying value of your assets and potentially liabilities and the amount for which they are recognized for taxation purposes. In other words, their corresponding taxation base. That's the theory, but I want to try and put that to the test. I want you to understand. Now, normally we talk about deferred tax liabilities. And deferred tax liabilities arise where the temporary difference is that the carrying value of your assets exceed the tax base. Now, that's only a temporary difference because ashes to ashes, dust to dust, eventually the asset will be sold. So we'll have no carrying value and no tax base. So it's a temporary state of affairs when the asset has been revalued upwards yeah, to give a higher revaluation than the tax base, or maybe we've claimed accelerated capital allowances to reduce the taxation base. But you get a deferred taxation liability when the carrying value of your asset exceeds your tax base. And we call that a taxable temporary difference. And we recognize a deferred tax liability as a result. And we are reflecting and acknowledging the fact that effectively the payment of tax has been delayed. The payment of tax has been deferred, been postponed. We are accounting for the deferred taxation liability. How prudent is that? Good. So to recap, gains give rise to taxable temporary differences that give rise to a deferred taxation liability. And to me, these three phrases are linked. Gains, taxable, liability. Like two and four and six. They are all even numbers. It makes sense that they're together. The gains have taxable temporary differences that give rise to a deferred tax liability. But you may be familiar with that symbol. Where there's a yin, there's a yang. And we can, of course, have deferred tax assets. Now, deferred tax assets arise fundamentally 
when the carrying value of your assets have been reduced, impairment losses perhaps, but you've got no immediate tax relief, so the tax base of the asset remains the same. So where the carrying value of your assets are smaller than your corresponding tax base, you've got yourself a deferred tax asset, yeah, because you've got a deductible temporary difference. Now, it can also be the case with liabilities that we've recognised the liability, maybe a provision, and we've charged it against profit, but we've got no current tax relief. It's not acknowledged. The liability and the expense of the provision is not acknowledged for taxation purposes. It's a non-cash item. They don't want to give us tax relief. So the tax base of the liability is zero, but we've recognised that liability. These two circumstances specifically give rise to deductible temporary differences. And if you've got a deductible temporary difference, that creates a deferred tax asset. And where, as with deferred tax liabilities, we've deferred the payment of tax, we're accounting for a deferred tax asset because we've accelerated the payment of tax. There's a yin and there's a yang running through all of this. Good. And I would like to recap because losses give rise to deductible temporary differences that gives rise to deferred tax assets. And like one and three and five, which are all odd numbers, these three phrases go together, accounting losses, creating deductible temporary differences, which gives us deferred tax assets. But look, the most important part is application, application and application. And I want to take you through three deferred tax examples. And the first example here is one which I think you need to read for yourself. So please stop the video, read this information and try and beat me to the punchline. Try and work out what you think the deferred taxation liability should be at the year end. Now, if we're going to calculate a year end deferred taxation liability, we need to calculate year end temporary differences, which means that we need to determine the year end carrying value of the asset. And at the beginning, the carrying value of the asset was 500, but you've just charged depreciation of 50. So we've got a carrying value of 450. Now, the opening tax base or tax written down value is 400. The tax allowances, the capital allowances are 80. And therefore, the year end tax base is 320. You don't need a calculator to realise that your temporary difference between the carrying value and the tax base is 130. The carrying value of the asset is bigger. So this is a taxable temporary difference and the rate of tax is 20%. So if you've got the figure of 26, I'm really pleased. Yeah, and that's how you would arrive at the figure of 26. That's your year end deferred taxation liability. But I want to give you more. I want you to think about what would happen in the profit and loss account. Because in this scenario, we've already got an opening taxable temporary difference. We've already got an opening deferred taxation liability. Because at the beginning of the year, the temporary difference was 100. Yeah, the carrying value exceeded the tax base 500 to 400 by 100. And therefore, at the beginning of the year, there's an opening deferred tax liability of 20. So from a P&L perspective, if you've already got a liability of 20 and you need 26, you're increasing that by six. Your additional expense, your additional deferred tax liability will be 6,000. 6,000, if you like, is the debit and the credit, the double entry. You're charging profit 
and you're increasing the liability. But I repeat, I want us to be also thinking in terms of, yeah, uh, how this might be played out in the financial statements. And you can see there on, on, the, on the left hand side of the screen how this is panning out. So if this was an adjustment that hadn't been made in question one, and if this related to the parent company, there'd be no impact on the non-controlling interest and the adjustment would be an additional deferred taxation liability of six, and the adjustment would be a reduction in the retained earnings, the group retained earnings, by six. So you can see there, uh, they, those two adjustments are both in the bottom half of the balance sheet, so the balance sheet would still balance. That's our first example. One down, two to go. Read this question. Stop the video. Think about the answer. This is the way that you're going to get the most out of this video. Now, the elephant in the room is impairment. Deferred tax is, is difficult to examine deferred tax in isolation. It has to relate to something else. And in this case, the asset has been impaired. All right. Although impairment is not specifically mentioned, there has been a damage to the asset. So that is an indicator that we should do an impairment review. Now, although we could sell the asset for 60, it has a value in use of 70. So an asset is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. And that's the case here because 100 is both bigger than 60 and 70. And the recoverable amount is the higher of what you could sell it for, the fair value, less cost to sell and the value in use. So I think we've got here an impairment loss of 30. I think we've got here, yeah, uh, an accounting issue. Now you're not going to get tax relief on impairment losses. So you're writing down the carrying value of the asset, but the tax base of the asset is still going to remain at 100. So this 30 is going to throw up a temporary difference. And that temporary difference is a deductible temporary difference because when you're dealing with losses, you're dealing with deductible temporary differences, you're dealing with deferred tax assets. And with a deductible temporary difference of 30, yeah, the carrying value is smaller than the tax base, you've got a deferred tax asset of six. Yeah, I hope you beat me to the punchline. I hope you realize that the answer was going to be six. Now, again, I want to explain this. I want to show you in terms of that you know, adjustments to the financial statements in a pre-populated environment. Again, I'm assuming nothing to do with NCI. Um, and because the asset was carried at cost, there's no suggestion that this is a revalued asset. So this expense would have gone through uh, the profit and loss account. So your, your, your net profit is going down, your post-tax profit is going down by 24. Yeah, you're matching the tax relief, you're gaining, you're recognizing the tax relief yeah, against the loss to mitigate the loss. So in terms of overall in the P&L, you would have an additional expense of 30 and you would have a reduction in your taxation charge of six. In your statement of financial position, your PPE has been written down by 30. Uh, the net effect is your profit is being reduced by 24. So that impacts on the retained earnings. And I've here, and I hope it's not too controversial, instead of recognizing a deferred tax asset, realistically, it would be more likely that it's reducing, uh, an, you'd be able to offset. So it would be reducing the uh, non-current liability, the deferred taxation liability that the company has got elsewhere on uh, other differences. Example two, two down, one to go. All right. Once again, this is now an opportunity for you to stop the video, to read 
that information and to think what you would do, how you would process the impact of goodwill of both the revaluation and, of course, because we're in a deferred tax scenario and it mentions deferred tax, the deferred tax implications. Well, there's a lot going on here and we've got a 100% sub, so we're not going to have to worry about NCI in any way, shape or form. We've got a fair value adjustment of 200 on the PPE. So that's going to increase the amount of the PPE. Absolutely it is. Yeah, the group PPE goes up by 200. Now, when the net assets at the date of acquisition are revised upwards, it squeezes the goodwill. Goodwill is a balancing figure. All right. You're deducting the net assets away from a bigger total, assuming it's a big positive figure for goodwill. So by increasing the net assets, you're going to be decreasing, reducing the goodwill figure. That is for sure. One thing at a time. That's the implication. That's the consequence of the fair value adjustment. And now on, on the goodwill. And now let's think about it in terms of the deferred tax. Because what's going on here is the carrying value, as far as the group is concerned, the carrying value of the asset is getting bigger. There's no current tax being assessed. The tax base remains the same. So this is a gain. This is a deferred tax liability. This is a taxable temporary difference. And you know the answer 60. Yeah, tell me you know the answer 60. And that is an additional deferred taxation liability. So from a net asset point of view, from a goodwill point of view, the net adjustment is 140. The net adjustment is 140. And I want us to take this very specifically into the pre-populated spreadsheet idea um, as to how those numbers could then be playing out. So in your statement of financial position, your PPE, your group PPE is going up by 200, but your goodwill is going down by 140. What you're doing to the top of the balance sheet is a net 60. And what you're doing to the bottom of the balance sheet is a net 60. The balance sheet will still balance. What you must not do is to think that the group somehow has made a profit from this. You only consolidate the post acquisition profits, the post acquisition gains of the sub. And this is all happening at the date of acquisition. So there's no adjustment to other components of equity. There's no adjustment to retained earnings at this stage. Of course, subsequently, that asset will be depreciated, assuming it has a limited useful life, and there will be additional depreciation coming through. But in terms of this scenario, that's the adjustment that you would be looking to make. My name is Tom Glendon, and we have been looking at deferred tax, and we have been looking at why we account for it, how we account for it, and I've taken you through three detailed examples. Thank you very much.